The museum's exhibit, Cultures in the Crossfire, Stories from Syria and Iraq, which you will have the opportunity to privately view in the hour following this program, does provide, I think, uh, the best context for reflection that we uh, have available uh, here in Philly. Our guest this evening is Wendy Perlman, a professor and award-winning teacher at Northwestern University, specializing in Mideast politics. Uh, Wendy was educated at Harvard, Georgetown, and Brown. We won't hold any of that against her here at Penn. Um, but uh, she speaks a fluent Arabic and has spent more than 20 years studying and living in the Arab world. Uh, we focused this evening on Wendy's book, as you know, We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled. Voices from Syria, which is a collection of intimate first-hand narratives from a cross-section of Syrian men and women whose lives have been transformed by revolution, war, and flight. Uh, Wendy will make an opening presentation followed by a conversation uh, between us and then concluding with questions from you. Following that, uh, Wendy will be uh, signing books uh, for those of you who don't already have them or those of you who have them and want them signed. Uh, back up at the registration table where you came in. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Wendy Perlman. Thank you so much for being here. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, this is a, a pleasure on, on many levels. I owe many thanks to the World Affairs Council, to the Penn Museum. Um, and a true pleasure to be looking out at a room of people, all of whom have my book. This is a, a, a rare, a rare treat and a, a true, a true delight. So I'd like to just say a little bit about how the book came to be, and then read some passages that will give you a taste, and then you all have the, the means to go home and, and read more yourselves. Um, so as was, was mentioned, I've been studying the Middle East for over 20 years. I began studying during a college semester abroad in the mid-1990s and continued studying the Middle East, studying Arabic, and so forth. Uh, so in 2011, when the Arab uprisings began as a regional specialist, I was captivated. But I imagine that most of you were captivated too, as most people on the planet, by those shows of people power, people going out to the streets protesting and saying no. But like many regional specialists, my attention quickly turned to Syria, where at the time, many uh, outside observers and even Syrians themselves were saying, Syria is a kingdom of silence. The, the population is too scared and intimidated by decades of repression. The regime is too strong. The military is too infused with the regime. Many thought maybe protests will go to one country to another throughout the Middle East, but not Syria. Syrians won't protest. So when Syrians also went out into the streets, often at tremendous risk to call for freedom and to call for di dignity, I wanted to know how that happened. I wanted to know why it happened. And most of all, I wanted to know what it felt like for some who maybe never ever imagined protesting to go out and protest. And I figured that there was no better way to know what it felt like and what motivated people than to go and ask them themselves. So I watched Syria from afar during 2011. In 2012, in the summer, I had my first chance to begin interviewing Syrians and collecting their stories and their points of view and their feelings and their reflections. By that time, the situation in Syria was already violent enough that I at least was too afraid to go inside Syria and do these interviews about protests and politics inside Syria. So I began to do interviews with Syrians who had fled as refugees. At that point, still a trickle, and now we know one of the most epic uh, refugee outflows of, of our times. So I began in Jordan, basically spending about two months interviewing every Syrian I could, and I got hooked. I continued on and returned to Jordan, then moved on to Turkey, to Lebanon, to the United Arab Emirates. As the large refugee flow moved on to Europe, I also moved on to Europe and did interviews in Sweden and Denmark and Germany, and then did some interviews in the United States as well. So over about four years and three continents and eight countries, I collected many, many stories. These interviews vary from short half an hour exchanges to sometimes group discussions where many Syrians would speak amongst themselves and I would be there audio recording their exchange to really personal testimonials where someone would sit with me for many hours, sometimes for days, sometimes uh, over years when I reconnected with the same person and he, would, he or she would tell his story uh, with a lot of intimacy. 
And my interviewees over this long stretch varied by age, by religion, by uh, hometown, by socioeconomic class, but the overwhelming majority identified as being opposed to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. And that's largely because I began this project with a special interest in protest and what motivates high-risk protest. And then my research networks just became stronger and stronger among the opposition. So this is really a revolutionary narrative. It can't claim to represent all Syrians, uh, but I think represents a part of the population that often needs with too few opportunities to represent itself. The same with this uprising and then war means to them in their own, own words. So as I collected and collected, and usually interviewees allowed me to audio record, so I had transcripts that then had to be, or audio recordings that then had to be transcribed, and often translated from Arabic to English. I had hundreds of thousands of words of personal testimonials, and slowly saw how these individual narratives coalesced into a collective narrative. There were themes and issues and events that repeated, and both in the overlap and the points of disagreement, I saw how they mapped onto the historical trajectory of, of Syria. This trajectory became the narrative arc of the book that you all have today. The introduction is in my voice, providing some basic historical context on the issues and events discussed by the interviewees, and then it's divided into eight parts all of which consist of exclusively a curation of testimonials or excerpts from testimonials. These parts begin with memories of what life was like under the regime of Hafez al-Assad, who seized power in 1970, then how life changed under the regime of Bashar al-Assad, the son who came to power in the year 2000, the start of the uprising of peaceful protests in 2011, their escalation, militarization, the evolution of the conflict into the brutal multi-sided war that continues until today. And then finally, uh, stories of how people fled as refugees, their experience as refugees, and then finally, finally, ending with some reflections. Syrians making sense, making sense of it all. So my job in putting together this book of testimonials then was something I like to think of like making a mosaic. My job was to cut from each long testimonial a piece, uh, treating the testimonial as if it were a stone, cutting some piece that would sort of let the gem shine through. So one part of the job was cutting, and then the next was putting these little pieces together uh, in a larger picture. So the picture completed itself, and the sum was larger than the parts. That's the book, We Crossed the Bridge and it trembled. So what I'd like to do now is just read some excerpts from the book to give you a taste of what they are like and give you some sense of this historical arc from the roots of authoritarianism to the current moment. So here we go. First, Saleh, a landscaper, from the first part, authoritarianism. Saleh said, we don't have a government. We have a mafia. And if you speak out against this, it's off with you to Beit Khaltu, your aunt's house. That's an expression we have. It means to take someone to prison. It means forget about this person. He'll be tortured, disappeared. You'll never hear from him again. Next, Ilyas, a dentist from rural Hama. He said, Syria had the appearance of being a stable country, but in my opinion, it wasn't real stability. It was a state of terror. Nobody trusted anybody else. Don't talk, the walls have ears. If anyone said anything out of the ordinary, others would suspect that he was a government informant, just trying to test people's reactions and gather sense of what was going on. It is a regime based on command and obedience. Every state institution recreated the same kind of power. The president had absolute power in the country. The principal of a school had absolute power in the school. At the same time, the principal is terrified. Of whom? Of the janitor sweeping the floor because they're all government informants. 
Okay. Next, I am. Later, when I become a web developer, here remembering his child. He said, the brainwashing process starts when you go to school. We love the leader, we love the regime. Without them, the country will collapse. You grow up with that in the back of your head, constantly reminding you that we are living due to the grace of the Assad family. But even as an innocent child, you see the whole system just reeked. It fed on corruption and grew and grew. If you want to get a passport, you have to bribe this guy or that guy and kiss that guy's ass, excuse my language. From when you're little, you are taught that this is the only way to survive in this country. As an active member of the ruling party, you're going to get better grades, better chances for better schools or jobs. Everything is handled by how loyal you are to the regime. So you're raised on the principle that you have to show your loyalty. Next, from part three of the book, that's titled Revolution. Here are the words of Shireen, a mother. She said, oppression was residing in us. It was part of our life, like air, sun, water. We didn't even feel it, like air is there. And you never ask, where is the air? But then, in one second, in one shout, in one voice, you blow it up. You defy it and stand in front of death. You have an inheritance. And after 30 years, you slam it on the ground and shatter it. Don't even imagine that it was easy to go out to a demonstration. No amount of courage allows you to just stand there and watch someone who has a gun and is about to kill you. But still, this incredible oppression made us go out. I encouraged my nieces and nephews to come with me to demonstrations. I felt that if they didn't try that experience, they'd be missing the real meaning of life. When you chant, you shudder, and your body rises, and everything you imagine just comes out. Tears come down, tears of joy, because I broke the barrier. I am not afraid. I am a free being. Sadness and happiness and fear and courage, they're all mixed together in that voice, and it comes out strong. Before the revolution, I thought that Syria was just the place where I lived, but it didn't belong to me. When the revolution began, I discovered that Syria was my country. Rima, a writer from Sweden, also talking about revolution, and she said, I was at a demonstration. I started to whisper, freedom, and then I started to hear myself repeating, freedom, freedom, freedom. And then I started shouting, freedom. I thought, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice. And I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. Next, from the part titled Militarization, the words of Captain, a fighter with the Free Syrian Army, who said, when demonstrations began, security forces came. We agreed that if they were going to shoot bullets, then we needed weapons, too. We were only chanting in the streets. We could have chanted for the rest of our lives without anyone even paying attention to us. But when the regime started attacking us, a lot of people who were on the sidelines started to join and protest, too, because of the blood. Blood is what moves people. Blood is the force of the revolution. From the next part, titled Living War, 
Abu Faraz, another fighter for the Syrian army, said, at first, one or two people were killed, then 20. Then it became normal. If we lost 50 people, we'd say, thank God, it's only 50. It's been so long since I heard that someone died of natural causes. Also in living war, Kareem, a doctor from Holmes. He said, my, sp my son spent the first years of his life stuck inside because of the curfew and the bombing in Holmes. He had no contact with anyone but his parents and grandparents. He was two years old when he saw another child for the first time. He went up to him and touched his eyes because he thought that he was a doll. Next, in the section titled, Flight, the words of Talia, who said, The night before I left was the longest night of my life. I was alone with the kids, and the planes were in the sky all night. The sound of planes is scarier than the sound of barrel bombs, because you hear them and wonder when the bombs will drop. The waiting is harder than the actual. I didn't know if we'd leave the next day or this would be the night that we died. <clears throat> I had seen children torn to pieces before, but I wasn't strong enough to see my own kids in that state. I needed to get them to safety. The kids woke up and I got them dressed. I got two pieces of paper and wrote our names and phone numbers and put them in their pocket. That way, if someone got killed, people would know their identities. I waited for the driver outside. I kissed the walls on the street because I knew that I was never coming back to them. And finally, I'll close with the words of Adam, the media organizer, in the final section of the book titled Reflections. And he said, one of the most profound things that I learned from this experience called the Syrian Civil War is that the process of finding out what a country needs is never clean. Of course, when you are in a stable country with functioning institutions, it's easy to have a moral code. But these values are only possible because other people did dirty things to put that system in place. We opened a Pandora's box. We had this innocent, childlike interest to see what was inside the box. We thought we'd get a present, and what we got was all the evil in the world. Now we need to close the box again, but it's going to take a while. What's crucial in this whole process is that you really don't matter. You, as an individual, mean absolutely nothing. And that's when you understand why people get radicalized. You're in dire need for a narrative that can justify this futility. Otherwise, it's too painful. Now I'm working with an NGO that helps the free media inside Syria. I see my job as trying to support people who want to make their dreams come true. But I'm too old to dream now. In a month and a half, I'll be 29. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the decision to focus on personal narrative um, and, uh, and the way in which that plays into the way people sort of will perceive uh, the issues here. Yes. Right? So um, for decades, uh, there's been a debate in terms of people telling stories uh, about the Holocaust in World War II. Mm -hmm. and part of that debate has been that there's a natural tendency for human beings to look for uh, happy endings or, or, or lessons that are sort of inspiring and uplifting in some way. So there's a focus in Holocaust stories on survival, uh, resilience, redemption, um, acts of kindness in the midst of brutality. Um, and we look for those sort of positive things, the silver lining, if you will. Um, 
but maybe in some way looking for that obscures the dark cloud that is the bigger picture. So uh, in terms of putting this together and your choice of, of, of what stories to tell and how to tell them, did you wrestle at all with, with this issue of, is my, real, is my goal to give the audience a, a front row seat to the heart, to sort of bring them into the darkness, or is my role to give them stories that will, in some way, uplift them about the, 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 the positive aspects of human nature that can come to light in the worst times? Oh, terrific. And everyone can hear me okay again, too. It's a, it's a great question, and, and perhaps the cop-out answer is, is a bit of both. Um, but I think that my first priority and my first mission was to create a book that, that accurately mirrored what I was hearing from Syrians themselves. So uh, I recently had a, a Syrian colleague read the book and gave what, to me, was the highest praise when she said, nothing in here surprises me. Like, uh, we've heard this all before. This is my story. This is my parents' story. This is my neighbor's story. To which I said, Fantastic, that means I got it right. My first obligation was to try to write a book that, that, that Syrians who lived through these experiences would read this and say, yeah, that's, that's my story. That's our story. And I think that that story contains quite a bit of both. There is resilience, there's, there are stories that are tremendously inspiring, but it is in a context of horror, of people carving out ways to make a difference, to continue to hope, but none of that um, precludes or denies the fact that this is a, a tragedy of epic of epic proportions. So I wanted to capture the horror, and there's there's a lot of horror in there. There are stories of prisoners who talk about being tortured in prison, there are stories of violence, um, and there are stories of dreams being crushed. Um, but to capture even the horror of the dreams being crushed, you have to capture the um, amazing inspiringness of the dreams in the first place. So I think that dreaming is a theme that, that, that for me is woven as bookends um, and, and woven throughout. So the first, the first entry in the book, if you guys all flip it to see, is, is, is a, the entry of a drama student who says, um, you know, a, a Syrian citizen is a number, merely the number on your ID card. Dreaming is not allowed. And the rest of the stories capturing the authoritarian era capture the sense of corruption and repression, sort of limiting the horizons of possibility, where to dream of change was foolish. To go out and fight for change, reckless. You were just going to get yourself and probably your family in trouble. And then as the story continues, there's a daring to dream. People risking their lives, risking their, uh, their health, risking everything to go out and say, enough. And that's the kind of climax. And then you see the wrestling as, as that dream of, of, of an uprising that would bring about freedom and accountability and a new system of rights and protections is not achieved. People cope not only with the horrors of violence um, and the most brutal of wars, but they also cope with um, the trauma of watching that dream um, be, be crushed. So by the end of the book, there's this sort of will to keep dreaming even as the reality is so harsh and, um, uh, and it's almost just a sheer force of will to keep dreaming that something else is possible. So what inspires me in terms of the bright is the will to try to keep dreaming, but it is in a, uh, a context in which um, those dreams become smaller and smaller. And that's the brutal reality and it would be a, uh, a disservice not to, um, to paint that, that brutality in its in its sheer intensity. So I know obviously the, the book is, is telling, uh, is, is sort of uh, an effort, and I think a successful effort, to accurately record individual stories. Um, but given that we're the World Affairs Council, um, I want to talk about policy and, and what, and, and, and um, you don't hold yourself out as, yeah. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a policy expert in this area or a policy maker in this area. But I want to talk about your own views Given, the, given what you've learned and the immersion that you've done. So uh, the, this, the excerpt you read about uh, the gentleman saying, we open Pandora's box, yeah. we have to close Pandora's box. Um, many people look at Syria and, and draw the conclusion that what we've seen is uh, the victory of, of, of brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, that the Assad regime uh, decided looking at what happened and others, uh, Tunisia, etc., 
uh, that they were going to respond uh, as brutally as possible with all, essentially no limit on brutality. And they've been willing to keep that up. And then they've been aided by it by major uh, uh, international powers in, in the form of the Russians and the Iranians and others. So um, is the lesson for the world that that dream of freedom uh, on the part of the, of the Syrian people or that portion of the Syrian people, that that dream of freedom was a mistake, that it brought upon them this incredible carnage, um, and that the, the purveyors of the carnage have been allowed by the world to win the war. Essentially, at this point, it looks like the future is a, a, a substantial restoration of the regime's power in much of the country. So when you look at it, do you see, again, sort of from the macro level, do you see uh, the success of a dream or the potential even for the success of that dream, or do you just see the Pandora's box that needs to be shut? Yeah, it's, it's tough in terms of, of drawing lessons, and I think it might depend on who, who it is that's drawing lessons. There might be lessons here for dictators who want to stay in power. There might be lessons for societies living under authoritarian regimes wondering what are the possible prices of fighting back? And then there are lessons for the rest of the world who are external to this battle between states and societies and wondering, and wondering what to do. I mean, it's, from the, from the very beginning, the Assad regime said, I mean, that the slogans that were, that were touted by loyalists to the regime that were written on walls was Assad or will burn down the country. So it was a slogan that rhymes in Arabic. And in many ways, it was either Assad or will burn down the country. And that is a, it was a, a threat and a promise that has been carried out. This is a regime that's basically been willing to use any type of, of, of violence against its population in order to stay in power. So the question is then, should people have never have risen up, or should the international community have done more to stand by a popular uprising calling for, for freedom and, um, and done more to, uh, to show the regime that there would be real consequences for its violent actions? Um, if it was interested in, in, in going forward in arming or helping to arm a, a, a red rebellion that was becoming increasingly militarized, to do so in a way that was enough military support to help that rebellion actually win, as opposed to what seems to have been the case to have been enough to keep it going, but not to accomplish this regime, uh, the, its uh, the goal of regime collapse. So I think that there are, there are various lessons, but I, I, I would not want the lesson to be that for populations that are unlucky enough to live under unfree regimes, they have two choices. Either that slow, that, that life of unfreedom, of, of the indignified life, of no rights, no protections, the life of living under dictatorship, or total and utter destruction of the country, mass displacement, uh, half a million dead, and, and, and all the horrors that we can tick off in Syria. This is for some people who are just unfortunate enough to not live under free and democratic societies. They can either choose um, your dictatorship or, or or total destruction. I would hate to. I I, I guess I, I have trouble accepting that in the 21st century that these are the only two options for 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 these types of societies, and that the international community has so few means at its disposal to help there be a third way to some sort of political transition, um, whether it is through more meaningful diplomacy, whether through it is, it is smarter, more unified, more strategically oriented military intervention, that there are not a range of, of options available to help guide people to a third path, rather than say, to say, um, we're sorry. We're sorry, Syrians who wanted to live with freedom. Freedom's not for you. We know that you'd like to go out and speak your mind. That's not for you. Dictatorship is your only option. Um, it, it, it seems that there has to be more. So your answer to this question may be implied by what yeah. you've already said, but I want to ask it anyway. So uh, um, even quite a few admirers of President Obama are now saying in public that uh, the Obama policy in Syria is the great stain on his uh, administration's legacy. And making the comparison to President Clinton's failure to act in Rwanda and later apologizing uh, and, and declaring that he himself viewed it as the great mistake of, of his administration. So um, 
President Obama went to, to Cairo in 2009, the very beginning of the administration, and essentially called on Arab populations uh, that were being oppressed by dictators to rise up. And then when we saw that in Syria, as you've laid out, uh, it did not, uh, did not respond in a way that enabled that revolution to be successful or helped that revolution to be successful. Is, what is your view about American policy in these key years uh, and the responsibility of the United States in the form of, of President Obama for the horror that we've seen? Yeah, I, I think I, I join the chorus of people who are also great admirers of President Obama, but also critical of, of his policy on, on Syria. So my understanding of, of President Obama's uh, rationale and logic, which certainly has a, a lot of validity to it. I mean, he's a clearly an extremely intelligent and thoughtful person who put a lot of thought into his, his stance, um, was one, a sort of suspicion of military interventions in general, a sense that the United States should do, do, do more policy multilaterally and have a, a sort of less grand vision of the U.S.'s uh, state-making and state-breaking view of the world is one element. Two is his interpretation of the Libya intervention, um, which was, I think President Obama's interpretation was, was an intervention that happened under the best of possible circumstances. A U.N. mandate, Russia on board, a multilateral coalition, no real friends of Gaddafi out there, and still um, an intervention that led to disastrous consequences in terms of Libya, the state collapsing and being the wreck it is today. So President Obama could look at that and say, under the best possible circumstances, this is where intervention goes, under Syria we have tremendously more difficult, complex circumstances. You have Russia and Iran firmly on the side of the Russian uh, or the, the Syrian regime. So the U.S. would be going in and potentially risking some sort of a confrontation with Russia or Iran, which would be very difficult. No U.N. mandate with, with Russia vetoing um, U.N. Security Council resolutions and so forth. And um, uh, a messy, complex, uh, a more powerful regime with more powerful state apparatus and military, not like Gaddafi, that would sort of crumble like a house of cards. So it was a very difficult case for intervention. My understanding is that the president looked at this and again and again would say to his advisors, can anyone guarantee to me that if we, the United States, would intervene militarily or in more muscular ways, will this go well? Will it collapse the regime? Will that lead to chaos and violence? And will it be better? And of course, these uh, interventions are filled with unknowns and uncertainties. That guarantee couldn't be, be, be given. It could have ended worse. It could have ended better. There were lots of there were lots of unknowns, lots of uncertainties about what the regime would do, about what other parties would do, and so forth. So I think that the president could look and see that there were great risks of greater action. But I was one of, I think, consider a, a you know sizable cohort of people who say that there were also risks to inaction, and the largest being that the regime has allowed and carried out crimes against humanity, mass atrocities again and again. So there's now this new Amnesty International report that's just been released today, I believe, that even um, besides what we know about the chemical weapons attacks and the barrel bombs attacks, even on the quieter level of the regime, sort of um, surrounding and starving communities with these local ceasefires in which communities are basically um, fighters and civilians uh, agree to be evacuated and, and deported from their, their towns essentially because they're being starved to death. So even on a quieter level, these are atrocities that are happening again and again um, because, as many Syrians in my interview would say, that the red light sort of fiasco of, of, of um, you know, the chemical weapons are a red, a red line and, and so forth, and when there was not real consequences to uh, real consequences and accountability for that chemical weapons attack, that red line became a green light for the regime to continue to carry out um, uh, acts, big and big and small. So I would have, I was of those who would want, um, of the view that the risks to inaction uh, are, 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 um, are terrible risks to be accounted for, not just the risks of action. And, um, and believe or hope that greater pressure on the Assad regime and its allies um, would have or could have made a difference. Um, that there was the call from President Obama in, in August 2011 saying that the Assad uh, as a leader was illegitimate and should step down, but uh, leaders of this sort don't step down unless pressured. I think there was some calculation with the United States that there would be some military pressure on the battlefield 
maybe enough arming or supporting of the, of the uh, militarized rebellion that would put enough pressure on the regime to begin to negotiate, but not enough pressure to collapse it that could lead to a chaos. And there's a certain you know, rationale to, to that calculation, but what I think what it has, what it created instead was a protracted war in which the, uh, the regime has proven its ability to um, withstand that pressure and is now gradually reconquering territory and positioned to win militarily. Now whether it will win on the long term politically, in terms of really being able to survive as a political system, there's still a lot more to that. But militarily it seems to have had the upper hand. In looking at uh, uh, Libya, Egypt, and Syria, kind of taking it as a whole, um, there's an argument that has emerged uh, on the right, I would say sort of the Bannonite right, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that basically an argument that says Americans might like to believe that democracy uh, is uh, appropriate everywhere and can work everywhere, but that what we have seen uh, is that democracy simply is impossible at sort of the stage of cultural development that exists uh, in the Arab Middle East, uh, and therefore dictatorship is the only form of, of stability. How do, how do you respond? Well, I think on one hand, I don't think it's for uh, it's the question is of whether we think other countries are ready for democracy or should have democracy. I mean, it's just giving you the slightest glimpse from some of the testimonials I read. Millions of Syrians and then more, many, many more millions of Arabs throughout the Middle East went out into the streets themselves calling for free calling for freedom, calling for system, systems that respected their basic rights, calling for basic accountability, calling for corrupt leaders to be dismissed through free and fair elections, calling to be able to have political parties and newspapers, and being able to control their own fate. It wasn't for us in Washington or anywhere else to decide whether these folks should have democracy or not want democracy. They went out risking their lives demanding it. So then the question is, what do we do when they are being faced by bullets? People, normal people, men, women, children of all walks of life went out demanding, calling for freedom. And they were met by regimes that did not want to give up power and were willing to kill their civilians, kill their citizens, and use every other technique too. Sectarianization and media and propaganda and mercenaries or so forth, but ultimately violence to stay in power. So. Do we stand by our claimed ideals of human rights and democracy and civilian protection and right to, and, and responsibility to protect and international norms of that sort and never again, you know, the, the slogan, never again mass atrocities, or do we sort of abandon these folks to their fate? So I don't think it's that societies are not culturally appropriate for democracy or ready for democracy. I mean, this is the sheer kind of cultural arrogance of even speaking in those terms. But people have shown their willingness to go out and fight and, and die for democracy. And I think my own self, I mean, what sacrifices and risks have I taken for my democratic rights as an American citizen? Now, most of us can like, barely, you know, go, be bothered to go out and vote. What, have I ever risked my life for rule of law and for freedom? I mean, Syrians did, and Arabs throughout the Middle East and the Arab uprisings did. Now, if though that's not a people who's ready for democracy, I don't know what is. I mean, there's a, in terms of respecting, knowing what's at stake, knowing what it means to live under a system that's not free, but they have very powerful regimes that have existed for decades, that have learned how to manipulate institutions and resources and the economy and international allies and coalitions to keep those authoritarian regimes in power. I mean, there, there's a reason authoritarian regimes have survived for decades and decades. They've been built and sustained and are good at surviving and ultimately have, have, uh, have violence to deploy as, as necessary. So um, it's not that societies aren't ready for democracy. It's that these are really good authoritarian regimes and, um, and when they've crossed the lines of violating human rights, um, they've met with a lot of ambivalence by the international community in terms of um, standing up for human rights. Uh, last question from me, and then we'll turn it to the audience. Um, what do you see as the future for the Syrian refugee population in, in that, has, that has left? I mean, so you have, there are various historical models in terms of, in some cases, people being absorbed into the countries that they that they fled to, 
um, and considering the place they left as a historic homeland but not their current home. You have, you have the, the Palestinian example of sort of permanent refugee status in some ways. So what do you see as, as that future for that population? It's a terrific question, and I think it's a, it's a sort of train that's continually moving. Had you asked me the question in 2012, I might have very different answers than 2014 and 2017. So one thing that I've, I've noticed in doing these interviews over the years is that sort of becoming a, or being a refugee is a process. When I first started interviewing people who were displaced from Syria, who fled Syria in 2012, or when I, maybe they fled in 2011 or 2012, I met them in 2012, Almost everyone had their bags packed and was ready to return at any moment and were convinced that any day they would go home. Um, I always say, you know, I, I would talk to young guys who were like, I don't want to buy a can opener because I have a can opener in Syria, so there's no reason for me to buy a second can opener here in Jordan. And that's how much people are focused on going home. And I've seen over the years many people slowly begin to sort of absorb the reality that they're probably not going home anytime soon. Um, and that's why there were people who I met in Turkey or Lebanon, Jordan in those early years who now are in Sweden or Denmark or Germany or elsewhere. And part of their decision of moving on to Europe was the sense of there's not much, there are very limited opportunities for a stable, dignified future in the, in the border countries, at least as they, as they had found them at that point. And they were going to then risk their lives and their families' lives, go into debt or, or spend their entire life savings to take these perilous uh, dinghy rides across the, the Mediterranean to try to make it to, to Europe. So it's, it's constantly evolving in terms of how, uh, uh, how realistic and, and near the possibility is of people returning. So I think that part of the, ref, the, 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 that's a long way of saying that part of the expectation or prediction about the refugee crisis in the future depends on the possibility of people returning home. Because many still say they wish they hope that they would like to go home to their, their homes, even if their homes don't exist. The homes or the neighborhoods or even the cities, a dream of returning back to Syria and helping to build it. But whether or not they can depends on both when the war ends and under what conditions it ends. So again, most of the people I've talked to identify as being opposed to the regime of, of Bashar al-Assad. They cannot imagine going home while that regime still remains, um, to going back to Assad Syria. I talked to people who said, you know, after all that's happened, you know, all that I've lost, I'm supposed to go home and so Bashar al-Assad as my president? It's like unthinkable, besides the fact that many worry about their basic safety um, in terms of going back to regime-held territories as soon as they go through the airport or, or cross through government checkpoints. What is the assurance that they won't be hauled off to, to prison again? Um, so for many of these folks, it's difficult to imagine going back. One worry I have is that if as now, if it appears that the regime is, 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 is winning and consolidating again, should violence go down to some lower level that the international community deems the Syrian civil war is now essentially over? There might be some violence here and there, but we can declare maybe there'll even be, an, whether it was an actual agreement or the absence of an agreement, that the international community deems, um, or different countries deem, it is now safe for refugees to return. Because, so for example, in many countries in, in Europe, if refugees don't have formal asylum status, what they have is essentially a stay on deportation because it's unsafe to go home. Now, should the German bureaucracy or the Swedish bureaucracy or, or, or in Turkey deem things are safe now, you can be sent back, what are the conditions that people will be sent back to? So a lot of the future of the refugee crisis then depends on the host states and if they will allow refugees to stay or at some point under whatever condition decide that refugees should go home and they would have that power legally to say your visa, your three-year visa or your one-year residency is now, is now over, you can go back or buses can be sent over the border or so forth. So it depends on the host state's own uh, calculations whether people will be allowed to stay or not. Um, if they're not sent back to Syria, then people have various levels of opportunity wherever they are. In Turkey are treated as guests, and um, something like less than 1% of the Syrian working age population in Turkey is working legally, also working in the informal market, which they have very low wages and very uh, precarious working conditions. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of Syrian children working um, 
sometimes 14 hour shifts in sweatshops or agricultural fields rather than going to school. Those who have been lucky enough to make it to Europe are struggling with labor market integration, learning languages and so forth. So I think that you'll have to see very different patterns depending on who Syrians are, Syrians are, what they carry with them in terms of socioeconomic capacity, education level and so forth, what types of opportunities in terms of legal uh, education, residency, um, education and work they find where they are, but there are many, many unknowns and the question of um, being sent back to Syria at some point remains something that hovers in the air and um, I think that we should all be, be conscious and, and, and wary of because um, it can help hold real dangers for people. Thank you. Okay, questions from the audience, please. Who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, I am from Syria. Oh, I'm hi. Syrian refugee. Uh -huh. So at first, I really like to go back to Syria. Yeah. It's very difficult to start life here. So my question is, uh, there's two questions, but the first question is, like, why do you think the revolution became a civil war between Sunnah and Shia, or Sunnah and Arabi? The second question... I'm sorry, was it when or why? Or why? why? Okay. And the second question, uh, I mean, how, how, you know, like, this country will send refugee back to Syria if uh, many Syrian men, they have to go to military if they want to go back. So I like to go back, but I can't go back because I have to go to military, and there is also safety. Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. No, absolutely, and I think there's um, a huge reason now of many, especially young men, or anyone in the age, maybe 17 to 40, which could be considered able-bodied uh, military. Um, I mean, the, the regime is in need of, of manpower, so there's mass, there's mandatory conscription anyway, but now, I mean, the stories of young men being taken off of buses or who knows what um, to serve, so m many people uh, fleeing for the reason that they don't want to serve or not go back, um, because they'll be conscripted directly into the army. Um, uh, absolutely. So that's that's certainly a, a huge danger. And I, but I just worry about the bureaucracies of host states in terms of their calculations. I mean, I, I've been spending I spent the last two summers in in Germany. So there um, there are now sort of two visa statuses for for for, Syri for refugees in general, especially you see it in the Syrian refugee population, of a three year residency permit that allows rights for family to apply for family reunification. And sometimes three years. Of residency legal before it's it's subject to to question and renewal or one year residency which people are leaving sort of one year uh, living one year at a time and that's sort of called subsidiary protection it's not asylum it's essentially a status in which this, the German bureaucracy deems um, you have aren't facing direct per political persecution or danger but we can't send you back because Syria is unsafe but that's one year at a time so many are living in a sort of fear of at what point may those those one years maybe not be renewed? So um, it's I think there are lots of lots of, of, of questions that are quite fearful, and which is all to say that the dangers are still tremendous yeah. for anyone. A abs absolutely, absolutely, and I just hope that that host states and they're very are, are are very cognizant of those of those those dangers and make policy uh, accordingly. Because of course, host states have their own range of of, of interests that. Their domestic politics that might turn with an anti-migrant or anti-refugee sort of bent, their economic concerns, whether it's sort of sheer, uh, you know, cultural phobias or racism or Islamophobia or um, a country being fed up or terrorist interests or so forth. Um, but so I hope there, there remains real concern about the real dangers that any any Syri Syrians might face, the range of dangers anyone might face should he or she have to 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 go back. Um, the, oh, the, the question about sort of when the revolution became a sectarianized war. Um, I think it's 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 a, it's difficult to say, but one thing that I am always very interested in sort of sectarianization as a process and as a verb, as opposed to sectarianism as some characteristic of society. And I think that many um, in the West looking at um, sort of the 
ethnically and religiously diverse Middle East think that, oh, these Sunni and, and Shia have been fighting each other for hundreds of years. It's in society, it's in religion. There's a kind of extremism or tribalism that is almost like in people's blood. And as soon as there's an opportunity, people are going to fight each other again because the Sunni hate the Shia. As opposed to sectarianization is a political process to, that, um, that can be activated um, that, ide that identities can be politicized, and on their different political conditions, some identity might not be political at all. This is my religion, I pray this way at home, and it doesn't matter for politics. It doesn't matter for who fights whom, or who gets resources, or who has power, and who has denied power. You can have identities that totally do not matter for politics, but sectarianization is a way that certain identities can be made to matter for politics. And I think that is a process that we can study. It's not always there, it is made to happen. So how did this happen in Syria, in which it was made to happen, not because it was destined to happen, not because it was always there in people's hearts and just waiting to burst through, but was a part of the process of the war. And I think this was a part of the process that was made in which violence helped make sectarianism matter more than sectarianism made the violence. I see the sectar increasingly sectarianized society as a product of violence more than the driver of violence, with blood and loss and people's family members being killed and so forth. It brings out hatreds, it brings out calls for, re for revenge, it, it brings out a search to make meaning out of something that's happened. Um, these are all the things that can happen when people are, are pushed to um, because, they, because they, they are attacked or because they're afraid for their lives. So I think when a society is, is pushed and brutalized and from many different sides and the people from many different communities in Syria can, can feel existential fear, can, can, can mourn their dead, that this brings out these types of, of, of insecurities and um, both hostilities and suspicions and so forth. And there's also been a, a lot of study, and this is a view that comes through again and, Again, in, in the book, especially from people with a sort of oppositionist standpoint, is the degree to which the regime also used sectarianism as an active political card and strategy. Um, that from the very beginning, when people were you know, unarmed young kids were calling for freedom and dignity, um, saying that these are, are um, Saudi-supported terrorists who want to bring about an Islamic State, that the lives and the well-being of religious minorities are under threat, saying indirectly or directly, should this uprising happen and the, and the, the regime collapse, um, religious minorities, be they Alawite or Shia or Christians, are going to be a fear for their lives because there's going to be revenge and slaughter. So that was a very powerful political card that the regime could use and did use to, um, to activate the most terrible fears among religious minorities and, and cause them to sort of rally around the regime. Um, not necessarily because they liked the regime, but because they were deathly afraid of what would happen should it collapse. That was a, 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 a smart political strategy that then, in many ways, to go back to the metaphor of the Pandora's box, then created, uh, you know, opened a space um, for, for sectarianism to go out of control. Um, and of course, then people on various other sides contributed to that. Um, we have Al Qaeda entering the scene, you have ISIS breaking off from uh, Al Qaeda, and so forth. So there are many hands. Um, that, that, that contributed to a sectarianization process uh, and now it spirals to show the, the dirtiest of, um, of, of wartime experiences. So what is the solution? <laughs> so what is the solution? It's hard, I mean, like this young man saying, you know, a Pandora's box was open and all of our worst, the worst evil in the world came out of this. Um, and now how do you put the lid back on again, and it's, I, I wish I could think of solutions. It's, I think I had easier views of solutions in maybe 2011, 2012, even 2013. Now that we find ourselves in 2017 and this war is still going on, you know better than I do, it's... I mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's... There aren't easy solutions anymore. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult. I don't know if you have ideas of, of, of solutions. I think the solution between Syrians themselves yeah. is 
represent the United States and Russia, they make agreement and force the regime to. I mean, the regime will be still in Syria, yeah. but maybe they make a, 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 like a small solution. Frankly, I think many Syrians they don't want. Uh, just they want to go back. They want to be safe after mm -hmm. that. So they don't want that change they dream about because it's impossible. So uh, for me, like for my friends, we really like want to go back to Syria, but the regime does not accept us because we need to go to military. Mm -hmm. And uh, my family like have fear if even if I go back, they will take me to the military and as are my friends the same. Mm -hmm. But also it is difficult to establish a new life. So I don't know what is the solution. Mm -hmm. And even my kids, there is now it's xenophobia because of the Trump administration. So uh, we, we, we don't know. I mean, I left from Syria to Lebanon, from Lebanon to United States. And I think just my life is, you know, like uh, destroyed from revolution, from regime, from war, from everything. Mm -hmm. So we lost everything and the regime still. So I know it's very difficult, but I think people just need to understand what really refugee are suffering. Um, thank you. Thank you for yeah. your testimony. It's important. And I want to thank you, yeah. Andy. Uh, we, we are uh, adjourned for the moment, but uh, Wendy is available for, uh, for signing books.